Our Heavenly Father, we, we praise you because of the cross of Christ. We praise you because you so loved us that you gave your Son. And we praise you because on that cross, our Lord and Savior paid the penalty for our sin. Not in part, but in full. To the point to where he said, it is finished. And Lord, we, we're here today because we want, to, we want to become more like you. We want to, to know you more. And we want to live life as you created us to live in relationship with you. Father, I lift up this time and I pray that if there is someone here this morning who is not yet following Christ, that today would be the day that you open their eyes and they see their profound need for the Lord Jesus and experience the freedom that only he gives. And for all of us who profess the name of Christ, Lord, I ask and pray that we would understand today that you've called us far beyond religious observance. You've called us to a life of following. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. It's really great to see you today. Thank you. I was waiting. Someone did say that. It's good to see me too. I'm glad to see you. <laughs> if you're visiting today, you may be wondering what's going on. And by the way, if you look around, I'm going to ask you again to do a, if, if, just pray about it. And we have a family who already is. If you look around, you, you'll notice that, that it's, it's, it's way beyond 80%, which I praise God, right? That's, that's, that's wonderful. The challenge is, is that the parking... At this point, um, there's no more places left. And so when guests come, guess what happened? And when they see there's nowhere to park, oh well. And so they leave. And so I'm going to ask for you to please pray. Maybe 10 or 15 of you, just pray about migrating to our Saturday evening service to plant yourself there. We'll continue to open up space for Sunday. God's being good to us. And we just, as a church, we know it's not about us and we're here for God's glory, and we pray for the blessing of our communities. And that certainly includes people hearing the gospel. So I'm glad you're here. And if you're a visitor, you might be wondering too, did I walk into the country church? Um, once a year is a chili cook-off, and it's a big tradition where, yes, there's, there are hymns and, and people, some people in Western wear, I just don't have I don't have that. But so this is not normal, but this is actually a cool celebration day. And we hope you'll stay because we have food for everybody. Yeah, all right. Are yes, everybody's welcome. And you'll have plenty of chili. And we also have the exciting time where we're going to do a little fun activities at church. But we'd love for you to stick around. I want to ask you a, a, a couple of questions. And these are, of course, rhetorical uh, to be answered out loud. But I want, I want you to think about this. Who are you following? You might immediately think, well, I'm not following anybody. Um, I pray that you're following Christ, and so we'll get to that in a moment. But all of us, whether we realize it or not, are following someone or something, some set of ideas. So I want you to think about that. Who is it that you're kind of pointed towards? The second thing I would ask you would be this, and this is like the, the big question. Would you describe yourself as a follower of Christ. Now, when you answer that, a lot of folks will be, well, yeah, I'm a follower of Jesus. Let's differentiate between saying that I believe here in my noggin, right? I believe certain facts about Jesus to be true. And I come to services to, uh, to, to sing and to worship and to hear about Jesus. But mostly it's here. There's a difference between up here, which we, we do want our minds, we are to love the Lord with all our mind, okay? And actually following. Following. Following is like a follower of Jesus is someone who has repented of their old way of living and repented of their sin, has placed all their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and Him alone because they know that their own righteousness is as filthy rags and you can't save yourself. And Jesus is the only one who can save. So your confidence is in Him and not yourself. It's knowing that He died on the cross for your sins. It's trusting in Him and in His work, knowing that He rose from the grave, that He is King of kings and Lord of lords. It's abiding in him, resting, with, uh, resting in Him, walking with Him, becoming more and more 
by his grace like him. It does not mean that you are perfect. So again, we talk about this all the time because it's really important. Christians are not people that are saying, oh, I'm perfect. We, we're no, we know we're not. Our righteousness is that imputed righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. His righteousness. We are, by God's grace, becoming more like Him. But none of us would claim to say we're perfect. I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I fall down and stumble all the time. And I'm thankful that I have a gracious God. But following Christ is, is the issue. And it's a daily thing. It's a throughout-the-day thing. Now, some of you hear that and you say, well, maybe I'll recategorize myself. I, I wouldn't say necessarily I'm a follower of Jesus, but I admire him and I respect him. And I think he was a wise spiritual teacher, a good moral teacher. Well, we really can't have that option because Jesus made some really huge claims about himself. That he is the son of God, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. There is no way to God except through him. That if he's not who he says he is... And he's not a good moral teacher. He would be a liar. So we don't have that as an option to say, well, I don't want to look at him as Lord and Savior, but I'll admire his teachings because in his teachings, he said radical things and he kept saying to come to him. Some of you might say, well, and, and you, or might not say it, as you look at that relationship to Christ, you might think, well, I kind of go to him when I have problems or, or needs or I'm stressed out. But otherwise, I pretty much kind of live life without really thinking about it very much. And that's where a lot of people are today. We come to Jesus when we have problems, right? When life gets hard. But other than that, hmm, maybe not so much. And, and the challenge for us to understand today is, is that if we are going to say that we are followers of Christ, that we belong to Him, then it's not something that we might describe as a consultant kind of relationship. It's not something where we would say, yeah, I just come to Jesus when I have issues or I need whatever. It's Jesus' is life. Jesus is life. Following Jesus is life. It's to be a continual learning process. To be a disciple of Jesus means to be an apprentice, to be a learner, to become more and more like him. Jesus showing us how we are to live, him changing us. As he lives within us, he is changing us, and we are growing, and we desire to become like him, and we follow him. Yes, we do stumble, but we know that in him is life, and he's our only hope, and so we follow. So again, I would ask you, does this describe you? Is this where you are? Are you a follower of Jesus? We're continuing in our Easter sermon series, and today we're going to look at a period in the beginning of Jesus' ministry when he is calling people to himself to be disciples. Again, a disciple is a learner, an apprentice. I pray that today as we look at this text that we would understand that Christ is also calling us today to follow follow. That call never stops. A review, if you weren't here last week, or if you were and you forgot, last week we looked at John the Baptist thundering from the desert, calling people to repentance. And he's preparing the way for the Lord. He said, the kingdom of God is at hand. And people are coming to him. And his baptism was not uh, what we would uh, uh, look at baptism. His was a baptism of repentance. And so people were coming to him and confessing that they were sinful. And they were repenting of their sin, making way for the Lord. But after that, now, we see Jesus comes to John. You remember last week, John's like, no, no, I can't baptize you. But Jesus, who's going to identify with us, says, no, all righteousness must be fulfilled. And so he is baptized to fully identify with us. And then after that, the Spirit of God drives him into the wilderness where he is tested and tempted by Satan. He's victorious in that. And now he goes out and he is in the area of Galilee and he starts calling people to follow. To follow. First, he's casting a wide net and then we will see that he starts to specifically point to specific individuals. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Mark chapter 1. If you don't, we have a text on the screen here. Mark chapter 1. We'll look at the text in its entirety. And then we'll break that down. 
It says this of Jesus, passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going a bit further, they saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat, mending the nets, and immediately he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. Now, Mark's account here focuses on the call of four disciples. Peter, Simon Peter, his brother Andrew, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John, the son of Zebedee. So we're going to look at just these guys today in Jesus' call. You know there are 12 disciples, but we're looking at just the call of these four today. So again, let's look at verses 16 through 18. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And what? Immediately. Notice that word. You're going to hear it again in the text. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Now the Sea of Galilee had a large fishing community in that day. And Jesus has been in Galilee calling out for people to follow him, to repent, because the kingdom of God was present, was at hand. So he cast this wide net, calling everybody who could hear him, follow, follow. And then this scene unfolds. And you might say, wow, the kingdom of God that Jesus is preaching, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That sounds like John the Baptist's message from last week, right? But now you have Messiah himself amongst the people of God calling them, announcing the kingdom is here. Repent, believe. Now, just like today, no doubt many people would have heard this. You can hear the hustle and the bustle. There's people fishing. There's people all around the shore. There's people trading, doing all kinds of stuff. And here is this man walking through, and he's calling people to believe and to follow. Some, no doubt, probably listened. Thought, huh, that's interesting. Some probably paid no mind. Others were very intrigued. And we know from Scripture that Jesus had many who followed him, so no doubt some began to follow Now, Jesus had a lot of followers, but there are 12 who had a very specific and very special role in what we call the 12 disciples. Jesus invested in them personally in a very intense way, day by day, for three years. And among that 12, of the 12, he really invested in three. Even more so, as Peter, James, and John. So Jesus is calling people to be to repent and to follow. Some pay no attention. Some are curious. And then we see Jesus look at a couple of guys just going about their business, and he specifically calls to them. Look at that. Jesus says to them, follow me. Who's he talking about? Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon. That's referring to Simon, Peter, and Andrew. They're, they're fishing. They're fishermen. It's a respectable job. It's a, it's a, a blue-collar job uh, for that day. Um, and what we know of these men and of their personalities, if we're honest, these are not necessarily the, the guys that Jesus calls today. Might not be the kind of people if we were building a team or starting a church or that we would go, yeah, I'm going to pick that guy, particularly Peter, right? If you know anything about Peter. But I'm really thankful that Peter is, is here because that's the guy I identify with the most because I fall down a lot. I do a lot of dumb things. I'm not perfect. We're going to look at their characters here. So he's calling right now these two brothers. What's so interesting about this call? He calls them, and, and, and what do they do? He says they pass alongside the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus sees them. And he says, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And what? When did they follow him? Some of us today, some of you today, maybe God's been wrestling with you for a long time and you have been just saying, no, 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 later, I would humbly submit to you that today is that day. You don't put it off. Because the more we put him off and we talk about this often, the more that we put off God as he works on our hearts, the harder the heart gets. 
I have calluses on my hands from just the working out for all the years. And what's interesting is that they're not really you know, attractive. They do serve a purpose, but they're ugly. <laughs> And your heart gets that way in a spiritual sense. The more you resist God, it gets calloused. Today is the day. Immediately. Follow. If you sense him working on you. Let's take a look at these men. First, Peter. Now, this is the apostle that we also probably know the most about. He's certainly one that so many of us identify with. One minute we have Peter who's bold and ready to walk on water, right? And the next minute he's doing what? He's drowning. Save me! He's crying out. He's drowning in fear. One minute he draws a sword and he's prepared to fight for Jesus on the next. There's a servant girl and he's doing what? He's denying he even knows him. I, I don't know him. I don't know him. Simon Peter at times has remarkable faith wants to do anything Jesus says and at other times he is so out of touch with Jesus and he's bullheaded to the point, if you'll remember there was a time in Jesus' ministry as Jesus is telling his disciples that, that he is going to, to die and, and Simon's like no, this is not going to happen and then what does he say to Peter? Get behind me Satan! I mean, sometimes Peter is making this great confession you are the Christ, the Son of God and other times Jesus is turning around saying no! You're so far out of tune. So I don't know about you, but I, Peter, I kind of get. You're roaring and then, boom, you know, right? And I think that it's wonderful that Jesus calls him and that we have so much on him in Scripture because I think we need to know that, that God's grace gets us across the finish line. Because it's not just when he's following Jesus in his earthly ministry that Peter blows it, is it? No. If you're thinking, here's Peter, he's thundering after Pentecost and he's preaching, right? Oh, Peter, that's amazing. And then later on, Paul has to rebuke him because he has been compromising, he's been cowering in fear, and he's confused the church in Galatia because he's acting like the Judaizers. Peter, Peter, Peter. God got him across the finish line, and all who belong to him, God's not going to let you go. Take heart, he's a good God. So here we have Peter, and we know about him. You could do a whole series on Peter, and he will be amongst those three that Jesus really intensely focuses on. And here's Andrew. What do we know about Andrew? Well, we know from John 1.20 that he had been a disciple of John the Baptist. Andrew was a disciple of John the Baptist, and now we see him eagerly following Jesus. What's interesting to me about Andrew is we really don't know a lot about him. We just don't. He's kind of a behind-the-scenes guy, and I think that's also important, too, because a lot of you would say, that's, that's, who, that's who you are. You'd say, I'm, I'm a behind-the-scenes kind of a person. And I kind of like that. We know a lot more about Peter. The Gospels really only give us three specific Andrew episodes. After Pentecost, he becomes a missionary. Church tradition says that on this mission journey that he went to the land of what was known as the land of the man-eaters, which is what we would call modern-day Russia, that he went there to preach the gospel. They claimed that he was there. He also apparently went to Turkey, or what we would call Turkey and Greece today, to preach. And church tradition says that he was crucified on an X-shaped cross while preaching in Greece. Now, what we can infer from uh, Andrew's story is that one who followed John the Baptist and then he follows Jesus, that he had a deep spiritual hunger and thirst. He's looking. And that's where some of you are today. You're hungry and you're thirsty and you're looking for something that will fill that void, that hole, that thirst. Jesus says, come to me. He says, he is living water. He says, come to me, all of you who are tired and weary, I will give you rest. Andrew is this person, I think, that we can see that he's, he's longing, and so he's, he's ready to follow. As soon as Jesus says, follow me, he's like, yes, he's ready. He knows. He doesn't know, nor does Peter. They don't know where all this is going to lead. And we'll talk about that in a moment. When we follow Jesus, we don't know where he's going to lead us. There's always some part of us that wants to know how our story ends, Right? 
Where are you going to take me, Lord? What does it mean if I follow you? Will I be uncomfortable? Will this be stressful? What if something bad happens to me? You're not going to let anything bad happen to me, are you, Lord? Here's the thing, just in case to help you understand, maybe you can identify with this. I actually was, when I was in my um, latter teens, the beginning of my early, around 20 or so, God was really working on my heart, and I was just really wrestling and fighting God in so many ways. I was really rebelling and in a dark place. And I had this really strange and, dis and distorted view of God, and I knew better. My parents raised me, I knew better. But there was something inside of like, man, if I really go all in, because I hate, and this is going to sound bad, most of the Christian guys that I knew from my youth group were weird. <laughs> and I thought, I want to be like that. And if I do this, I had this also this strange idea that God was going to like make me not only really weird, but that he's going to send me somewhere like halfway around the world in some place I don't want to go to and live amongst people. It's like, man, I didn't want to do that. I just was scared. What are you going to do, God? And guess what? He, did, he, he didn't tell me. <laughs> he didn't tell me first. He, just, he, just, he actually, in his grace, gave me a severe mercy. He broke me because I belonged to him. And in that moment where I said, Lord, I give up whatever you want. I just give up. Just what? Just take me. Gradually he unfolded his plan. He's still unfolding his plan. Whether I became the weird youth group guy is up for debate. <laughs> mm, see if you're away. But some of you are afraid because you're concerned that if you really let go and you just say, take me. Whatever you want, that he will interfere with your relationships, your career goals. He might, he might well just say, I want you to do whatever, and, you're, and whatever scares you. Don't think that way. He's good. You can trust him. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? Jesus asked that. Don't look at him as you hear, follow me, follow me, follow me. Don't look at him and say, but tell me first how it ends. Follow. Trust him. If you can trust him with your eternity, can you trust him with your present? That's where, isn't that the profound disconnect for a lot of us? Oh yeah, I trust him to get me to heaven. Do you trust him with your now? No. Something's really wrong. What that really says is, I want him to get me to heaven, but I really don't want him messing with my now. He's Lord. We come to him on his terms. Now, Jesus calls these men, and you'll notice he gives them a new job. They're fishermen, right? So he says, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. He's going to put these men on a mission to be about the business of his kingdom. And guess what? When the Lord calls you, and when the Lord calls me, and when we respond to him, he gives us this new identity. We are now citizens of his kingdom. We are children of God. We belong to him, and we now are a part of his work in the kingdom. That's what we're called to do, who we're called to be. So I would ask you this, how's your fishing going? I don't mean you're fishing in the lake. How's your fishing going in terms of your relationship with the lost and to the lost that are all around you, all around me? Jesus calls these men and they immediately leave and follow. The kingdom, if you look at the Gospels and when you see Jesus calling, there is a profound sense of immediacy, of urgency, that when he calls, and his terms sometimes, we, we read this in the Gospels, we look at that and go, wow, that's kind, of, that's kind of strong. But what Jesus wants us to know is there is nothing more important than following him. There's nothing more important than being about his business. There's nothing more important than belonging to him. Example, Matthew 8. We see this story unfold when Jesus has some people who say, I, I want to follow you. I want to follow you. Matthew 8, 18 through 22. We see this scene. Now, when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go to the other side. Now, we have a scribe. Now, a scribe is a very religious person, a very smart person, a very bright person. A scribe came up and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. 
No, you would think that Jesus would go, yeah, that's one more. Mark that down as a follower. What does he say? And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. You know what he's saying? This is not going to be comfortable. This will not be what you think it is. This may at times be very uncomfortable as you follow me. And what we infer from this is that the scribe doesn't exactly become a follower. Verse 21, another of the disciples said to him, Lord, first, let me go bury my father. Now, we might think, well, that, that's a reasonable thing. The man's father just died, I guess. And so he wants to go to do the funeral, then he'll follow. So let him go bury it. That's not what's taking place in the culture. What is, is taking place here is that what he's likely referring to is that his father is older. And he's saying, wait, my father in time, he's not, he doesn't have much longer. Wait until he passes away. And then once I take care of all those affairs, then I'll follow. And then Jesus says something and we're like, wow. Jesus looks at him and says, follow me and leave the dead to bury the dead. He's saying, let the spiritually dead bury the dead. You follow me now. Not later, now. Wow, Jesus. That's not the, the warm, fuzzy little Jesus we see on paintings. You know the white Jesus with the long 60s hair? He's kind of willowy, right? That guy is like, hope you like me. Follow, please. Please. Oh, come on, please follow. Whatever. I'll, I'll love you. That's not Jesus. Jesus comes and says, here are my terms. I will give you life, but I have authority over all life and death. Follow me. But Jesus, I want to follow me. But Jesus, I want to now. 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 Following Jesus is urgent. It takes priority over everything, and that has never changed. It's still true today. So we go back to the Gospel of Mark now, and we see some more interesting and incredible responses in Mark 1 to Jesus' call. Verse 19 and 20, And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending the nets. And immediately, you notice immediate pops up a lot, right? Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. Now what's interesting here is that because when, we, when they say James and John, the brothers of, uh, the sons of Zebedee rather, they mention you'll notice hired servants in verse 20. That tells us something really important. That Zebedee evidently was a pretty successful businessman, successful enough to have his own servants. So this guy had a good family business. And guess what? James and John, they stand to inherit that business. It's a pretty nice deal, right? Dad's got this all set up. As long as we stay doing what we're doing, man, we've got a great thing waiting on us. Jesus calls and they go. They go. Jesus is more important. And I'm not telling you, please don't make this a, this is not, don't go home and tell your, your spouse, God told me today to, to quit my job. No, that's not what the text is saying. This is descriptive, not prescriptive. But I will say this, the kingdom is more important than anything we do. That includes our work. The kingdom shapes everything. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and then all these other things will be added unto you. When we are seeking Him first, delighting in Him first, when we're loving Him first, then everything else finds its proper, uh, proper place. That means our family, our work, our relationship, everything. But we get that backwards, don't we? We've got work, we've got family, we've got chores, we've got things we like to do, and then we bring Jesus into this little circle, saying, okay, here's my stuff. No, Jesus is over all of that. That's what he said. That's like over all things. So let him shape work, finances, family, all of that. Now, what do we know about James and John? A few details. James is the older brother of John. He's also known as James the Greater. That distinguishes him from James, the son of Alphaeus, and James, the half-brother of Jesus. He, too, is in this inner circle of three. Acts 12 refers to him as the first of the apostles to be martyred. He's killed by the sword under Herod Agrippa. If you're paying attention, you're going, hey man, you keep talking about um, these guys following and dying. <laughs> this is not encouraging me. I want you to hang on. John. Now, I don't know about you, but I look at John sometimes like, wow, John just like, 
seems like, wow, a lot better than I'll ever be. He's like this amazing guy, John. But John also stumbles, and John wrestles, and John has his own issues. What's amazing about John, John referred to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And some of you are like going, well, John, pretty arrogant. Like he didn't love the others? That's not what's going on. When John says that, what he's saying was that John was blown away that Jesus would love him. So he would say that about himself, that I'm the, that Jesus loves me. When was the last time you who say, I belong to Jesus, were blown away and were going, you love me. You love me. Remember the song you sang when you were a kid? That's still true. And a lot of us now, well, you could sing, Jesus loves me, and it'd be like, Jesus loves me. That should blow our doors off. He loves us. He loves you. And this is what John, he's crying, I'm the disciple that Jesus loved. He's blown away by the love and the grace and the mercy. And so we see John in his life as someone who is just, he can't seem to, to fully process just how amazing this love and grace and mercy is. He's always so grateful to Jesus. Now he is in his trajectory, in his story, he's the only disciple that's mentioned as being present at the cross. Jesus from the cross entrusted the care of his mother Mary to him. Church tradition says that he's the only disciple that was not martyred. He was tortured with boiling oil and exiled, but not martyred. He was said to be the leader of the churches in Ephesus, and it was there that he had Mary in his home and took care of her until her death. But under the great persecution of Domitian in the mid-90s, he was tortured and exiled on the Isle of Patmos. And on that island of Patmos, he has this vision of the end of all things, the end of the world, the victory of Christ over all things, the victory of God's children over all things, the consummation of all things, the new heaven and the new earth. He's John the Revelator. That's who this guy is. Jesus calls these men. And when these men follow... None of them know how their story will end. Because you think about it. Had they known, do you think some of them might have said, um, how about we strike a deal here? You change the end. You know what's so amazing? The way these men died and they were tortured. Here you have these disciples. And it wasn't just them, it was also the early church. It continues throughout history and it continues today in persecuted countries. You know what? You have these men who would not stop running around saying, He has risen. I have seen Him. I have touched Him. I have talked with Him. And so you want me to deny Him? No. I would rather die because He has risen. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. You see, how many of you when you were a kid, we'll assume, well, yeah. How many of you would say that you Every now and then, just a little white lie. <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah. The rest of you are liars, so raise your hand. <laughs> Remember when you were a kid? Remember when you were a kid and you thought you were pretty crafty? Parents, you know when you're kids, you think they're pretty crafty, and you're going, oh, my soul. You're the least crafty person in the world. And you know, you're, you know you're a kid, and you did something you shouldn't do. Now, my parents were wonderful parents. I was blessed, okay? So when I refer to... I know that now, I guess, some people don't spank or whatever. I, got, I get a spanking every now and then, okay? And I had a choice, and the worst was wait till your father gets home. <laughs> not that my dad was mean. Not that my dad was abusive. But what mom was saying when she said that was like, you really blew it, Buster. <laughs> and I knew it. I was like, oh, that was the dreaded words. So when confronted, I often had a, my parents would often give me a choice. If they knew when I was a kid and I lied, it was like, tell the truth or punishment. Which one do you want? Guess what I would tend to do? Oh, I'm, I'm everything, right? Spill your guts clean. And then I get sent to my room. It's like, oh, whew, thank you. And I get to come out and it's all good. All of these men, would you willingly die for a lie? If this was some kind of a made-up thing, 
If the disciples, let's say, hid the body and say, yeah, let's do this. And then we're wondering around saying he's risen and we'll start this religion and people will follow us and think we're the great men. Won't that be wonderful? If this is what's going on, because some people say, well, the disciples had to have hidden the body. There's no rising from the dead. That doesn't happen. Would you willingly die for a lie? No. Had any of these men, had that been the case, it was like, oh, wait, before you crucify me, I'll spill my guts. But they didn't. They didn't do it. They all said, he's risen. He's my Lord and Savior. Two days ago, there was an anniversary of sorts. I think it goes back to about 93 AD. But Polycarp, who was, that's like, which again, I told him last night, it's a great name for your kids. If you don't, if you're going to have kids, Polycarp is still out there. But Polycarp was a disciple of, a disciple of, of John. As an old man, as an old man, Polycarp was brought before one of the local governors in Rome. There had been all kinds of accusations about this, not, not, not burning incense to Caesar and all this stuff about not, you know, this whole Christianity thing where they claim there's just one God was getting people mad. And so he has this opportunity to either be burned at the stake or to recant. He's an old man, and what's interesting, what the, what the, the historians tell us was that apparently once he was drugged before the governor, and he sees how old and frail he is, he starts to feel sorry for him. He's like saying, come on, old man. I don't have to end this way. Just, just say it. Just say it. Just say, you know, just recant the stuff you're teaching. Let him go. I'm paraphrasing Polycarp's response. Was this... He knew his Lord and Savior. He said, he has been faithful to me all these years. How could I deny him now? And he died. Jesus changes lives. And when you know that you are his child, you may lose everything, but you'd rather have Jesus. If that's, if that's all you have, that's more than enough. These men start to follow Jesus. His public ministry is beginning. Over the course of this time, one will betray him. A close friend will deny him. Most all will abandon him in his darkest hour. Yet these same men will be restored and empowered and will be used by God to shake and turn an empire in the world and history upside down or right side up because he has risen. What's amazing about this is that all of these are what we might call average men. These were not the, 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 the most brilliant people of their day. Jesus called out to the common man and he uses the common man because guess what? The common person knows I can't do anything in my own strength. If it's going to happen, God, you've got to do it. And so they cling. So don't look at yourself and say, I'm nobody. God can't use me. God, use these men to shake the world. He will use you. Now, some of you are perhaps wondering as we get ready to close, okay, I, I know I need to follow, but I really do want to know because you have just talked about some really bad things that happened to these guys. How does my story end? What's going to happen? Jesus gives us some promises that are really important. He promises that he'll never leave us nor forsake us. He promises that no one can snatch us out of his father's hand. He promises that he will love and that his love is so great that, 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 that he will not only justify, but that our glorification is a done deal. He promises to complete the good work that he's begun. He promises that he will give us a meaningful and abundant life. He also promises that we'll be hated at times, that we'll be opposed, that we'll get in trouble, but he still calls out and says, follow. Follow. Trust me with your story. We're closing with this story to address the question that some of us have. It's an interaction between Peter and Jesus. Yeah, we see in the Gospel of John, 
verse 20, uh, chapter 21, rather, verses, the latter part of 17 through 19. Jesus is restoring Peter. Peter has denied him. He has failed and failed miserably, and Peter is filled with shame and guilt. And Jesus is restoring him. And he says, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you to where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, does this sound familiar? Follow me. Peter's story is someone who was used mightily by God, and his story ends with him being crucified upside down, according to church tradition, because he said he was not worthy to die in the same manner as his Savior. So Peter hears Jesus say these words, and he figures, oh, this doesn't sound like I, a really good things happening at the end. He doesn't know what it is, and so he asks a question. He looks at John. I like this because this again is us. I can see myself here. When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, he's talking about John, what about this guy? <laughs> and Jesus said to him, if it's my will that he remain until I come, what's it to you? Follow me. In other words, Peter, it's none of your business. You follow. You trust me. And that's the call that Jesus gives out today. Follow. In him is life. And there is not life in anyone else. Let's bow our heads. We're going to have a word of prayer followed by a time of invitation. If you were here this morning and you have not yet become a follower of Jesus, you do not yet belong to him. You've not placed your faith and trust in him, but today you have heard that call, follow me. Just let go, stop fighting, trust me and follow me. When we stand and sing in a moment, I will be standing here in the front. And if you want to, um, in the context of our worship as we are singing, give your life to Christ, and please come forward. I'd love to talk with you about it. We'll set up a time to meet. We'll pray. Today can be that day that you can leave here a brand new creation. Or perhaps you're looking for a church home and you believe this is where God wants you to plant yourself to be on mission with this church. And if you feel so led, please come forward and say, yeah, we want to plant ourselves here and invest in this place and serve here. And we'll set up a time to meet and we'll rejoice and we will do that. Yet some of you, perhaps like me, maybe you've drifted somewhere along the way and today is that day you just need to come back and say, Lord, I give up. I'm tired of trying it on my own. Just do whatever you want. Maybe you need to recommit your life to Christ there. Perhaps you just want to come up here to pray to worship. This is a continuation of our worship, so let's honor that respectfully, please. We're going to stand and sing, and we're going to ask that you please respond as the Lord leads. Our Father, we praise you. Lord Jesus, we hear you. I pray that we would all follow you because you are our only hope, and it's in your precious name that we pray. Amen.